and uh, this is uh, not so easy to uh, to compose a lecture because of the very homogeneous audience. Yeah, I would like to give you uh, overview that can be understood by anybody with uh, well just general knowledge of uh, of some basic stuff. But also, I would like to to show some of the problems that we are dealing with. Uh, on the level that would be also, for example, useful for the people from my group who are here. So, <coughs> well, and uh, uh, also since it's the uh, first time in this series of seminars that uh, uh, we are presenting uh, uh, Center for Nano Optics, uh, I would uh, first start with uh, just uh, uh, giving a view of uh, what we do and. Uh, uh, as you see, then uh, I, I would try to to make uh, breaks with something simple, with some just pictures and just some explanations. But uh, there, there are going to be some equations. Uh, uh, this cannot be helped, but I will try to justify the use of them whenever we have. And the title, uh, the ti you know, the case for quantum plasmodics, the case is just something that should be tried. And uh, maybe I should immediately say why, why, what is the reason for the title, because uh, uh, quantum technologies, there are many of them, there are quantum optics and, and so on and so forth. So why quantum plasmonics? And plasmonics, <coughs> as you will see later, on, has more problems than uh, maybe even advantages. So it has to be shown that it's useful to use plasmonics. And this is what I would try to show at least with one example are related to single photon sources. Okay, so let's start. Uh, well, Center for Nanooptics, optics you can go on the uh, internet and read about our mission, about our projects, uh, and uh, see the people that are working there. And uh, I'm happy to see that many of them are here, and at least now you can uh, uh, visualize and uh, to know when, whenever you meet them that they are from our Center for Nanooptics. optics uh, we basically have three directions, uh, largely speaking. Uh, the one which is related to the confining the fields at uh, uh, really nanoscale and nanometer scale, where we would like to, to send the light uh, through tiny waveguides in cross sections and to do different things, including uh, quantum uh, plasmonics, as we'll discuss. Uh, then uh, a little bit separately, this is uh, the field which is related where uh, we are looking into the uh, quantum sources, uh, meaning uh, the, 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 the sources of light that emit one photon at a time. So single photon sources. Uh, and uh, this is extremely important, and I'll try to explain why is it important. And we have also applied the direction where we can, for example, put colors on the logo of our university. And uh, this is just a uh, 100 by 100 micron uh, uh, picture where the, 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 the color appeared at a level of uh, uh, smaller than the wavelength. Uh, it's a uh, truly interesting achievement. But there are many of those uh, related to the uh, green energy sources and so on uh, with uh, uh, the names that are difficult to pronounce, but they do have meaning. Uh, occasionally, we have uh, even some uh, attention from the press, and uh, it's always uh, uh, a little bit misplaced, uh, the trust that they put into us. But uh, still, it's good. It shows that uh, whatever we do uh, brings some uh, or rings some bells in the society. Uh, and uh, of course, what, whatever we do, we are not doing alone. In Denmark, we have uh, Olbach University and DTU as a uh, collaborators. We have uh, uh, Kotiho in uh, Stockholm. We have uh, Manchester University, King's College in uh, UK, uh, Laser Center in Hanover in uh, Germany, uh, Burgundia, Strasbourg, and uh, uh, Madrid, Saragossa, and Barcelona. And last but not the least, uh, the uh, long standing collaborator in theoretical physics from Yerevan State University. These are only the, the, the places that, were, that we are really collaborating, meaning that we are publishing papers together, not just somebody we are talking to. 
So this is uh, kind of more or less the, the picture. So let's go to the uh, to this subject. And, and here I would like to, to give you the idea uh, why optic, optical technology are important. What is it that uh, drives people to use them and to use them on also on large uh, scale? And for, for some of you, this would be really like uh, uh, trivial, but uh, I think it's necessary to, to understand whatever I'm going to tell afterwards. So communications, uh, you know, in any communications, we should have uh, basic uh, elements, like uh, we should have a, a source of information, we should have the encoding process where information is put on something, like here on the current, uh, then uh, transmitter, decoding, and the uh, receptor, the you know, receiver of the information. So this is electrical communications, and optical communications, they work pretty much in the same uh, with the same logic, it's only that we have optical fiber, which is uh, put somewhere in between. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason why we have it uh, would come a little bit later, but uh, here you can see the, the uh, amazing network of optical cables uh, in the world that is already developed. So uh, the question, of course, uh, arises, uh, why do we need the optical communications? So let's, uh, and uh, that, that, uh, that is now really important. Let's take a look at the, at the communication again. So we have a signal transducer that puts this, uh, the information, speech, or whatever, in the electrical signal, right? And then uh, 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 the, the carrier can be current oscillation or electromagnetic wave. So if you think about quality factors for communications, then we are concerned with the speed of information transfer, rate of information transfer, security. So, uh, of course, in terms of speed, we would immediately say that light is uh, beneficial because of the uh, very large speed of the propagation. Uh, the rate of information transfer, this is the key uh, thing that I would like you to understand. You see, the point is that uh, when, when, we, when we, we, uh, we should transmit our, the information, we should put information on the carrier. Previously, it was just writing the letter and put physically on the carrier who was carrying the, the letter, right? Uh, if you have uh, the wave, which can be current uh, in, the, in, in the wire, or it can be electromagnetic wave or light, then there is oscillation of current or field or whatever. Then we put our information, well, nowadays we know that it's uh, digital, so it's a sequence of zeros and one. So how do we do it? We basically chop this, uh, the carrier. And therefore, we produce the signal. And uh, then uh, from here, it's more or less clear that the uh, information can be, be put more than we have period of the wave. That is a very trivial but very important fact. So if the frequency here of this signal, for example, is 2 gigahertz, then we can put only one bit per second. Otherwise, you destroy the wave, nothing would happen. So frequency of the carrier, uh, you, instead of vibrations per second, hertz, megahertz, you put bits, right? Then divide by two, and then you have the information transfer, the best you can achieve. And this is really very important. Okay. Well, security typically can be done with usage of cables, but uh, that is... Uh, uh, of course, not so. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I don't know how to remove this. Okay. Uh, so, uh, speaking about information, so let, let's find uh, let's find out, find out how much of the information speed we really need. Uh, so, in the, for example, in the station like uh, we have now, when uh, uh, somebody is giving the speech, hoping that other, uh, others are listening, then uh, the highest uh, information rate that we need, uh, we can estimate simply from the highest sound frequency that we can hear, which is uh, 20 kilohertz, and therefore 10 ki uh, kilobit per second is enough, even if it's a symphony. And uh, since I'm not going to sing, I would say for me, one kilobit per second would be more than sufficient. No, I'm not. <laughs> so, uh, 
well, so it's not much. But now we are coming to, to something that came up during the last 20 or 25 years, like computer games, right? And here we have images, or uh, better images uh, with the modern computer games. So uh, to have a, such an image, uh, you would say, well, it should be uh, about 10 megabit. That's the content of the image. And then it should move in the real uh, world. And that means 32 images per second. And suddenly, it's already 320 megabit per second. And this is just to play the game without any processing, without anything. So this is already a serious number because uh, that would allow two cities uh, of, of, of audience talking uh, all the time simultaneously to transmit this information. So you see, uh, the, 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 the numbers do matter. And uh, uh, coming to the question, why do we have to have uh, optical uh, information channels, optical information systems? If, we, if, it, if they look, uh, we look at the possibility for the wire to transmit uh, the signal, then uh, there is a natural uh, fundamental limit which is related to the fact that in the wire we have distributed resistance as capacitance. And for those who know radiotechnics uh, or anything related to uh, circuitry, uh, the, there is a, uh, the time of reaction is the resistance times capacitance. And that's why we have this limitation. And uh, this is actually a quite stringent limitation because uh, uh, A is cross-section and L is the length. And, and length is supposed to be much larger than cross-section. It should be thin wires. Uh, and you can see that uh, this is going to be uh, quite small. In reality, this is about uh, uh, 10 gigabit per second. This is what uh, it's called aspect ratio limit in the bit rate capacity. Uh, and basically, the more rate we need, the shorter wires we should use. OK, 10 gigabit per second, uh, you can say, OK, well, this is uh, a lot. But actually, it's not if you think about computers, right? So there we, we have to synchronize all the chips. Uh, looking to the optical information, the uh, optical channels, the carrier frequency of light and the visible light is 500 terahertz. And that means we divide this by 2. So here you have the real limits that you can achieve with optics. It's 250 terabit per second. Now, this is really bandwidth that it's not so easy to fill even with the modern uh, computer uh, games uh, or uh, virtual reality with 3D and uh, what's not. So uh, of course, optical communications are not really just appeared uh, <coughs> during the last years. It started quite a long time ago. Uh, and uh, Indians they were, and uh, other uh, people at that time, they were using uh, uh, fires to transmit the information. And actually, the name, uh, this the land of fire that was suggested by Magellan, that was because when he was uh, you know, moving on the ship along the co coast, they were warning others that uh, white people are coming. And it's not necessarily good. It's typically bad. Well, how bad they did not know. But uh, uh, so, so that, uh, that is uh, already optical um, information channel. But the speed of information uh, transfer, even though it's OK, because it's still visual information, but the rate of information, that's uh, how often you can uh, use your blanket to close and open the, 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 the fire. This is not uh, <coughs> very speedy. OK, and security is nothing, uh, practically absent. And this is how we come to fiber optical communications, where the light is go through the fiber optical cable. And now we have, again, the, the usual uh, scheme, uh, where the, uh, we have the transformation of input data and the optical signal, and then it goes through the fiber. Uh, I'm uh, not going to describe the principle of guiding. Uh, uh, let's just say that uh, there is such a thing as a refractive index. And if it's larger than the medium, then the light can be kept inside. Uh, uh, it has been discovered quite some 
time ago and now used in, uh, for making all fiber optical cables. Uh, so, but here we have, uh, we have again uh, a problem or the problem because the information capacity of the just fiber, just one fiber, it's already, we know, it's 250 terabits per second. Now we are coming to the computer where there is a electricity and the electrical uh, connects, they have 10 gigabit per second. So there is a uh, so-called, uh, the problem of the last mile. It's a huge information mismatch. So it's just like uh, if you uh, take Jumbo jet, come to the destination, and uh, this is what it's waiting for you, right? That's, uh, that's about the same uh, uh, scale of the comparison. Uh, and uh, here, uh, this is exactly where optical uh, interconnects off and on the chip are coming, which is uh, quite already developed now, used uh, silicon-based uh, nanophotonics. Uh, and uh, so here is the hierarchy of interconnects. And uh, we already discussed that when it's a long distance, uh, we, we cannot have wires long. They should be short. And the more information we should put, the shorter should be wire. So the point is that uh, there is a crossover where electronics is better at this moment of time and where the optics is better. And this uh, crossover moves to the left all the time. And it's already, actually already now somewhere interboard chip-to-chip uh, -chip communication. Uh, and soon it will be on chip. So just as an example, uh, in uh, supercomputers two, 2006, there was uh, only 5,000 fiber cables here, whereas uh, in uh, this system, this is a 500,000 fiber cables. That's only five years difference. Okay, that is uh, why it's needed to have optical interconnects. And there are different uh, uh, developments in the field done by all companies like uh, IBM and uh, uh, other producers of, the, um, uh, of, the, of, of, of computers. So they, they are, uh, of course, looking at this on-chip optical routing. Uh, that's the uh, uh, nice pictures. But they're actually coming from, from IBM that... Uh, uh, really uh, investing a lot of efforts into this. And this is the vision how it should look like uh, with uh, 90 nanometer silicon integrated nanophotonics and how it would look on the chip. So uh, this is really ready for the development. It was uh, uh, set in 2012, so uh, this is not a news. Yeah, that's a, a state of that picture. So where, uh, what can we gain with our plasmonics? Because now I, sh I should remind you that we are coming from plasmonics. Well, the point is that uh, the, uh, when we have guiding in the fiber, we have the, uh, the mode which is confined to the certain extent. And this extent is so-called diffraction limited. It's limited by the valence of light. So if you start squeezing the, the fiber, the light would go out, as pictured here. So first it would follow the decrease in damage and then would spread. And uh, nothing can be done about it. It will be always the wavelength of light that you are using. Uh, and uh, this is where the uh, plasmonics come into, because uh, this is the situation with the electric wave guides with the usual light, and this is the situation with plasmonics where this, for example, can be dielectric and the round is metal, or otherwise it can be metal around as dielectric. The point is you can squeeze it indefinitely. And uh, if you would like to have the same speed and much smaller size, then plasmonic is the only, uh, is, is the only possibility that can be also seen from this uh, uh, development of the operation speed and uh, the, 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 the density of uh, uh, of different uh, you know, technologies used. So uh, there, is a, there is no way around it. We have to get smaller with interconnects. Uh, that's why it's uh, now 10 years ago that was suggested this picture where the operating speed and critical dimension, 
the way put together picture in electronics, which can be very small, but limited in the speed, and photonics, usual light, which can be uh, basically unlimited at this scale with the operating speed, but limited in the size by the wavelength. And this is the place of the photon plasmonics, which can do both. It all looks so nice that uh, I, can't, I can't believe it myself. And why, why is that? Uh, well, because uh, there are laws of physics that should be st strictly obeyed, right? And uh, those laws say that whenever you have metal, you have absorption. The metal is not transparent, so how, how can you guide, guide light with the metal? Of course you cannot. It's, it's simply not possible. Uh, so or you lose the energy all the time. And th this is the main problem. This is why it's, uh, even though plasmonic is here, but it really had, have problems coming into the application. Still, separate, uh, some individual components can be made which would function well, like this uh, a drop multiplexer probably should skip the, uh, the description of how it functions, but uh, it's the optical component which is used uh, which is using uh, surface path on polyelectrons, so plasmonics, let's say plasmonics, so it's made of gold and there are grooves, but everything is so tiny that, uh, uh, as you can see here, the diameter of the ring is 10 microns. And this can do wonderful stuff like sending one wavelength to another, one side, another to, to uh, one goes throughput and another is dropping and then you can add your information. It's a basic element in any optical uh, communication network. Uh, and because it's small, then uh, the losses can be tolerated. So this is the one answer. So you can use plasmonic if you can, uh, if it's an uh, individual component, and then you can tolerate losses because of the gain in size. Or for example, you can, uh, make uh, tiny modulators, like uh, it's uh, the, the example, which is uh, really the, the, the state of the art of modulator, which is using plasmonics. It's again, light is conducted in this uh, tiny, tiny gaps, 20 nanometers, 20, 50 nanometers. Uh, everything else is gold. Uh, and uh, the speed with which uh, we can uh, put the information in is 72 or up to 100 gigabit per second. 100 gigabit per second. That is uh, uh, unbelievably uh, high speed. This is really where we can uh, start exploiting the, 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 the information bandwidth of light. Uh, okay. But uh, now, try to imagine that we solve everything all problems with plasmonics, right? So we switch to light, uh, we, we use plasmonics, so it's, it can be as small as uh, one nanometer in sizes. We, we dealt with the loss problem, heat dissipation, which I did not even mention. Uh, then uh, what, what is next? Well, the next is quantum computing, of course. And uh, if you look just into Wikipedia, then you find that quantum computing is uh, it's something that is using uh, superposition and entanglement. And uh, uh, yeah, well, I would like just uh, to say a few words about it because uh, that is really important. Uh, at least, even if you don't, uh, you will not understand uh, what it's all about, but you will understand that it's completely different from usual logic. And this is what is important for quantum computing. It's completely different logic which is uh, in use. And uh, the, well, uh, the quantum technologies are really now on the rise. It will be new flagship in, in Europe is uh, lots of uh, billions and billions of uh, euros invested in the research in this uh, field. So uh, that is something probably that you heard. This is the, the famous Schrodinger cat. Uh, and <clears throat> the idea is very simple. So you have a uh, black box, and inside the black box you have a cat, which is alive. But only because uh, this uh, vial, this poison, is uh, not broken. How it can be broken? 
there is an atom here which can, at arbitrary moment of time, emits a photon. And this photon would be detected, and then uh, the mechanism will initiate, and the vial would be broken, and the, the cat will die, right? The, 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 the tricky point is that uh, if the box is closed, you don't know whether the cat inside is alive or dead. When you open, of course, you will see it's either dead or alive. But if it's closed, you don't know. And you don't know when it, when it happens, because the emission of photon is a quantum mechanical process, probabilistic. So there is a probability that it will be emitted within, let's say, 10 nanosecond. But maybe you will wait, uh, you will wait one year before it will be emitted. It's also possible. It's not non-zero probability. Uh, so now when you believe that you understood it, then uh, the, the, trick po the, the, the tricky issue here that it's in the physical reality is such that inside the co uh, the cat is exists in the superposition. It's ne neither alive or dead. It's not about opening or not opening. It's really both dead and alive at the same time. Okay, uh, and then you so-called uh, do the measurement when by opening, then you will see whether it's alive or dead. But otherwise, it's uh, it's a, and uh, uh, this is not so easy to to grasp. But uh, uh, that's the uh, the essence of superposition. That uh, in quantum mechanics you have superposition of states where uh, the, the 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 outcome is probabilistic. And you, uh, whenever you start doing something, then you should project on it. And and this is this is the essence of quantum computing, because you have all the information, it's, uh, well, like all, all uh, these zeros and ones, they're talking to each other simultaneously, all over. They're all connected. Even, I mean, if you don't understand, it's OK, because I'm not sure I do. Uh, and Einstein had uh, huge problems with understanding that. He did not believe in it. And uh, this uh, point of view that it's neither alive nor dead this so-called Copenhagen uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics, and uh, now it's proven to be correct, which was not so easy to prove. OK, so what about entanglement? This is <laughs> another tricky stuff. So, so you, uh, prob it's probably easy to explain with photons. So you send one photon here, and then it splits into two. And uh, because of the conservation of momentum, if uh, one photon oriented like that, then another oriented like that. So they're always anti-parallel. You don't know in which way they are, uh, they are oriented until you do the measurements. So here are the measurements you are doing on, on this detector. You have some uh, arbitrary sequence of the events. And here, also arbitrary, but uh, it's always opposite to this one. Now, the point is that these two uh, sorry, uh, these two detectors can be miles and miles away. There is no communication. And so you measure the photon there, and then the, the answer that you get there would be giving you the answer with the, what you will find there uh, simultaneously. So that means it's a, like a fabric of reality which uh, has no limitation in size. This is another. Uh, tricky point. Uh, and uh, of course, it's uh, used for all the, uh, you, you can start thinking that uh, uh, if you entangle the, this guy and this girl, then uh, depending what, whether you measure uh, and find the, the, the guy here, then it must be the girl there. But uh, with, another, with the equal probability, you can find girl here and the guy here. So do they move with uh, speeds larger than light? Yeah, well, now you know that uh, this is something which is really difficult to accept uh, with your logic. And that's why you can do uh, calculations which ordinary computers, ordinary computers, no matter how fast are they, would uh, uh, use the, 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 the lifetime of universe, and they, it's, they will not finish doing it. 
OK? So that's the point. Well, now to cheer you up about this, uh, here it's a nice picture about how is your computer prototype coming on. Great. So the project exists in the simultaneous state of being <laughs> totally successful and not even started. You see, that's a superposition, a really superposition. Now, the punchline coming now. Can I observe it? That's a tricky question, <laughs> right? OK, well, but we can at least observe and participate in the process of getting started. And uh, this is what, uh, uh, what we try to do. And I, I'm really coming to the uh, case of quantum plasmonics. Because we heard that quantum plasmonics, OK, it's a small and so on, but it's so lossy and so messy. And so, so what can we gain? Uh, and here I would like to explain, on, just using one example, quantum information needs uh, this uh, special states qubits. It should be, uh, that should be talking to each other. One of the way, maybe the only way, is by using individual photons, single photons. So you have to have a source of single photons. Uh, and indeed, control of single photon sources, that has been called uh, because of uh, the reason I just mentioned, enabling technology for quantum information. So without it, no goal. So you have to develop these single photon sources. Okay. So uh, so let's say that we have uh, a two-level atom which can, by going from excited to the ground state, emit one photon. And here we have quantum circuitry which, that should use this photon for uh, further uh, information processing. So what do we do? Well, we eliminate the uh, molecule, atom, quantum dot, whatever. Uh, and after a while, the photon is emitted and go to the quantum circuitry. So that's the process. Okay? Now, the point is that uh, the the, the lifetime uh, of this state is uh, given by the fundamental constant. You can't really uh, change much it. Because you see, there's a Planck constant, speed of light, frequency. This is a dipole moment of the transition, which is also varying within limited uh, uh, scopes. So what does it mean? It means that lifetime is around 10 nanoseconds. That's it. And if it's 10 nanosecond, then the information speed that you can do with such a source is 100 megabit per second. And uh, that, that, is, uh, that is the largest. And this is simply not enough, right? I mean, what's the point having, we were talking about 250 terabit per second and uh, all these uh, wonderful things that we would like to do. So what can be done to decrease the lifetime? And the answer is Purcell factor. And uh, yes, this is the gentleman, uh, Edward Mills Purcell, who actually got Nobel Prize for physics. Uh, but he got it for the discovery of uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, which is nowadays used everywhere. And uh, personally, I can add that uh, I was uh, studying physics by uh, using the uh, the course that was written by him on electromagnetics, and maybe still in use, I don't know, but uh, uh, it was very much used in my time. As far as the quantum optics is concerned, his most famous paper is this one, where he considers the, uh, the, 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 the ways of influencing the lifetime of the excited atom. Now, now you are coming for the big surprise, I hope, because now you will see the paper in the whole entity. That's the paper, <laughs> right? That's all. So one should probably learn that maybe you don't have to write diploma thesis 100 pages. It's a, the paper like that can be uh, so famous. And uh, the formula that he derived is here. So he derived the factor. Uh, that uh, speed ups the process of uh, emission, 
uh, and containing the Q factor of the resonance, wavelengths, and the volume of the resonance. So, uh, if we consider in a quantum dipole emitter inside the cavity, like a picture is here, then the, the time is reduced by Purcell factor. And essentially, it's a Q factor dis describing how many oscillations in the, in the cavity is possible without, before leaving, uh, and the volume of the cavity, OK? So if you consider the electric-based cavity, right, before going to plasmonic, we start the electric-based uh, cavity. Then uh, the, the volume of the cavity is diffraction limited, is lambda divided by 2 in medium. Uh, but the Q factor can be huge. It can be 10,000, even more. Uh, if you just try to put it here, then you will see, well, it's, you are promised uh, 10 terabit per second. Can you do that? Well, the answer is no way. And this is important because this is actually, even though quantum optics and so on, it was a long interbeing and uh, it was uh, not, it's not often spelled out. Now we will see why. So let's consider the dipole emitter inside a very good cavity, right? So it has problem getting out. So so what? Uh, from the fact that uh, the, the emission is fast. So the, 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 autumn, uh, the, the atom delivers the photon very fast, but then it cannot leave, leave the cavity because it has high, huge Q. Very good cavity, it means very large uh, quality factor. So the lifetime in the cavity is proportional to Q. So that means you, you try to, imp to increase proof of factor by increasing Q, but you're decreasing uh, uh, the speed with which photon can leave the cavity. And therefore, the emission time is actually the maximum of the two. It's either the uh, emission from the cavity or emission from the atom in the cavity. And that brings a very simple formula, a fundamental uh, limit for the situation. And uh, which uh, comes to the fact that it's, uh, the Q is determined, and this is diffraction limited. So you have a limit which cannot be simply improved because you cannot, you cannot go down with V. It's related to the lambda. Uh, I would, uh, just with the risk to be a little bit too scientific, I would like to show you a little bit uh, uh, more of the, of, the, uh, of the science. At least this is for those that, uh, for, for whom it's important. So if you have very good cavity, what happens inside? That uh, energy is exchanged between red lights, this is the energy in the molecule, in the atom, and uh, green, this is the energy outside, but in the cavity. So this is so-called Rabi oscillations. So this is the, the energy is kept inside the cavity. Oops, sorry. Uh, but it's oscillating between atom and the cavity, atom and cavity. And it takes long time for the photon being emitted. You see, there's a probability of photon being emitted. In this unit, it's 20, and it's still probability less than 90%. Uh, if the cavity is poor, then the, the photon leaves immediately. But then Purcell factor is uh, weak. Uh, and, and therefore, the lifetime of the atom is large. And it again take, ta takes lots of time to, for the photon to get out of the cavity. You see? But in the optimum case, in the optimum case, that is just uh, these two trends, they are balanced. Uh, and uh, it lives uh, pretty fast, at least uh, the fastest possible way. Uh, so if you put it down into numbers, then uh, this is actually the limit for uh, the electric cavities. 
54 gigabit per second, which is, I would say, not much. Again, it's not terabit. So this is why we have to seek help from the plasmonic. And the plasmonic, we don't have cavity, but we have uh, particles that resonate. They have, uh, uh, if you send the light on this, it would scatter particular wavelengths, if it's gold or silver. And this is like resonator. Uh, this is what uh, gives these colors. And essentially, it's related to the uh, uh, variation of the refractive index with frequency, so-called localized plasmons. So leaving these details, uh, well, those that know that uh, for them it's nothing new, and uh, for others it's not interesting. So, uh, OK. So in, in plasmonic, we have a nanoparticle, which is uh, resonant. Uh, and uh, the only difference with the previous case is that this nanoparticle is also absorbing. So we have poor sulfactor, but we also have a really bad term where shows that if you have absorption, then we don't have much em of emission because it's absorbed by the particle. So that, that's, that's why it's a, it's a really an art to use plasmonics. Okay? But uh, on the other hand, the volume has no limitation because we learned in plasmonics you can squeeze the light to the uh, nanometer scale or Anstrom scale or whatever. And this is what helps. So you can put everything together. Uh, you will find also the limit. Of course, there is always a limit. In nature, if you do everything correct, all consideration, you will find the limit uh, just around the corner. But now it's a loss limited. It's not because of the size, but it's because of the loss. And when you put numbers, then it's, uh, you are coming to terabit per second. It's 100 times better. So you see, this is really the case for plasmonics in, uh, in terms of uh, the really justification of uh, trying to realize this single photon uh, sources with plasmonics. And uh, there were already some experiments. Uh, well, I'm skipping the, the, the th this is just, uh, well, this might be interesting. This is how you find, uh, you determine whether it's a single photon source or not. Uh, the, the light coming out of, this is the particle, this is the uh, molecule, splits into two. And then you have two detectors. And then you correlate the, the click here and click here when you uh, introduce delay time. And when delay time is zero, then it's only one of the detectors clicking if it's a single photon source. So this is how you find out that you have only single photon by doing this uh, correlation measurement. Uh, and uh, the width of, the, uh, of this minimum is related to the lifetime. If the lifetime is short, then it's very narrow. If the lifetime is uh, long, then it's very wide. And when you have the source just on glass, then it's wide. When you have near plasmonic particle, then it's uh, very narrow. Uh, so I should say that uh, this is also what we do. And uh, Sebastian, uh, for example, uh, recently published a paper with, uh, uh, well, he is the principal also uh, at least doing this experiment, uh, which is essentially very similar to what I showed in the previous slide, the results are still, I should admit, not as good as in, in, in the best experience, but we are getting there. The, uh, the good point is that we are using nanodiamond, nanodiamond uh, with vacancy instead of the quantum dot, and therefore uh, this is the source that lives forever. Quantum dot molecules, they can be bleached, they can be destroyed by powerful light, but this is really uh, the future. And you can see again this difference in the width of the curve. OK, so risking to, yeah, a similar case. Just, I will go f fast with this one because it's the last one. Uh, but it's even more interesting. Instead of just sending photon, it's nice to send it in the waveguide. 
And, uh, and again, the, the physics and the, the conclusions are the same. When you have dielectric waveguide, you have diffraction limit, you have poor solve factor and diffraction limit. Now it's limited uh, by the group velocity. And group velocity, even in the best photonic crystal waveguides, uh, the largest you can do is about 100. Okay, so uh, there is a limit what you can do here in terms of poor solve factor. If you use plasmonics, but it's a plasmonic waveguide, uh, then uh, because of squeezing the field indefinitely, even by taking uh, the loss into account, you can at least, uh, with uh, reasonable uh, numbers, you can at least reach poor solve factor larger than 100. Uh, so this is also, I, I show this, this also because it's a, one of the, our directions of the research that we are doing. And uh, the, the best results here actually were obtained by uh, our person, Shalesh uh, Kumar, who is, uh, but they, they were obtained at DTU. We are still uh, trying to get uh, uh, something on this level, but uh, I would say with maybe uh, better uh, grip on waveguides. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, I'll skip the technical details. Uh, it's the main point is again pay attention to the squeezing of this uh, minimum that it's uh, it's feasible so it's feasible it's a lot of work that's why it's so so difficult even for the same person going to another laboratory to try to to achieve <laughs> that is not a trivial uh, uh, work okay so. Actually, quantum plasmonics, just to finalize, I mean, the, this word or this combination has been kind of coined only three years ago with this uh, review paper in Nature Physics. Before that, it was just kind of talk, but in this paper, it really was mapped uh, the directions, the problems, and so on and so forth. And if you Look, for example, in publication of quantum plasmonics. You, you will see immediately, well, it's, it's really extremely new field, but uh, exponentially expanding uh, with the number. It's uh, from uh, Web of Science, of course. So that up to 2010, there were only uh, seldom one or two publications, but now it's uh, really exploding. And I, I, um, I made it yesterday. So uh, from this year, I'm sure it will be at least double as much as in the previous year. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, our uh, main research interest is coupling quantum images to plasmonic excitations in, the, in this roadmap right in the beginning. But I would say that this roadmap, uh, it was done three years ago. It was too optimistic. I think we are still uh, maybe even went a little bit further. This is a so, so complicated, uh, incredibly complicated stuff. Okay, and then I would like to acknowledge uh, funding agency, but most of all, the people in our center, that uh, really all of them are involved in, the, in whatever we are doing. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>